It's episode 206 of the Author Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Hank Garner. Thanks for joining me for these 200 plus episodes. And you can find all of the archives of those 200 plus episodes over at hankgarner.com or authorstoriespodcast.com. I'd like to thank some sponsors this week Dominion Rising, 23 all new novels, brand new, never before released in this one package. For pre-sale right now, only 99 cents. Uh, It goes live in uh, just a couple of weeks now, so go grab it while you can get 23 brand new novels by some of the best writers today for only 99 cents. A lot of the uh, early reviews are coming in, and they are fantastic. Dominion Rising, there's a link to it in the show notes. Also, the new novel from Stefan Bolt, Six String. A beautifully written masterpiece by Stefan Boltz. If you are a fan of his writing like I am, you know that there are certain things you can expect. You expect you can expect stories that take a turn that you never saw coming and ones that just grip you by the heart. Uh, six String from Stefan Boltz. Go pick it up today. Also, Galactic Satori Chronicles from Nick Breaker and Paul E. Hicks. Uh, some of the very best science fiction that you will read today is going on right now in the Galactic Satori Chronicles. There's two volumes, Volume 1 Earth and Volume 2 Quran. Go pick them up today. They carry the author story, seal of approval. Also, my good friend Ed Gosney runs a blog called Cool Comics in My Collection, and every Thursday he releases a new collection of comics, ones from his collection, ones that sadly got away, and he also finds a way to connect it to what's going on uh, in his life and his collections. So go check out uh, Cool Comics in My Collection at edgosney.com. Also, like I told you last week, his uh, book Transmutations, the audio book, is out now, and it's fantastic. I've been listening to it. I think you're going to love it. Uh, go pick that up, edgosney.com. As always, at the end of the show, we're going to have a clip from my good friend Richard Gleaves and his Jason Crane series. Thank you for listening to Author Stories. And uh, like I've told you before, uh, we've been invited to cover Dragon Con this year. If you would like to help support that effort to upgrade some equipment and uh, to make it the best we can, go to paypal.me slash author Hank Garner, and you can donate today. All donations are greatly appreciated. Thanks for listening. is dying at the hands of a brutal empire. Brother Dust, a changeling born amidst a sandstorm, has seen it all before. He's watched as the heavy imperial boots have crushed dozens of planets, watched as their drills pierce the core of a world, slowly killing it while the natives are kept docile and compliant with the gifts and pleasures the empire brings from the stars. He will watch no more. Brother Dust will use his ability to mold his own body into devastating weapons to wage a one-man war against the malevolent High Father and the Empire's diabolical machines. The body count is rising, but the Empire must be stopped. From the writing team of Steve Bowyer and Aaron Hall comes Brother Dust, The Resurgence. Pick it up today on Amazon.com. Brother Dust, The Resurgence. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, One thing I absolutely love about doing this podcast is uh, the relationships that I've formed through these past several years doing the show and getting to meet new people. And uh, there seems to be this cast of characters that keep coming back around uh, again and again. And that's because not only do they bring... Uh, great things to the show, but they have brought great things to me personally and uh, have been a a good influence on my life. Uh, So uh, saying that, I'd like to welcome Nick Cole and Jason Onspock to the show. Nick and Jason uh, have a new book series out, uh, Galaxy's Edge is the series, and it is uh, doing phenomenal things. And they've got a really interesting story behind uh, this, and we're here to get the story behind the story. So uh, Nick and Jason, welcome back to the show. Thank wow. you for having us, sir. Yeah, that's yeah. an intro. That's pressure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like to come in hot and then, you know, see where you take it from there. I always wanted a cool name like Ace or Iron Mike or, mm. you know, something cool. But I think 
my nickname is going to be Bad Penny because I keep turning up. <laughs> <laughs> Nick Bad Penny Cole. Bad Penny Cole. Just bad Penny's not bad. It's, it's kind of bad. It's late nineties punk rock. A little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it has a good feel. It, it does. Yeah. It does. Kind of a kind of a post punk. You know. Kind exactly. Of, yeah. 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 Because yeah. because punk is uh, is not exactly cutting edge enough. You no, and you'd have further. to have a disgusting name. Bad Penny's a little too slick. Yeah. You'd have to have, like, scum or slime. Like, if you were an 80s punk, you'd have to be scum or slime or rancid, or yeah. mucus, S- mm-hmm. snot. Yeah. Snot. <laughs> Cafe <Cafe-me. laughs> <Cafe-me. laughs> Didn't take you long. Didn't, Didn't take, take him long at all. <laughs> Didn't take him long at all. I think we're, uh, yeah, about a minute and 20 seconds. Uh, we went straight for the Cafe Bay. Oh, Lord. Um,. So uh, we were talking beforehand. I think Nick holds the record for most appearances on this podcast. I've got to go back and and parse it out exactly, but uh, you know, hence I, the bad the bad penny. Hence the bad penny. So, um, but you know, aside from all that stuff, uh, you guys have two books out: uh, Galaxy's Edge Legionnaire and Galaxy's Edge uh, uh, Galactic, Galactic Outlaws. Outlaws. I've, completely blank there for a second and uh i i emailed the two of you the other night and i said like oh my god you guys have done it this is this is the the star wars not star wars uh that i have been looking for and um you know i I think there's a when you have something that comes out and is very successful there's a lot of buzz surrounding the book that is not the book and you know people have opinions about well you know it's successful because you did this and you did that and and you know and everybody immediately wants to uncover the scheme uh, that made your book successful and the thing that just hit me like a two by four upside the head was these books are fantastic that's the reason these books are sitting at the top of the charts because they're freaking awesome um so i i emailed you guys to tell you that because i i just you know um uh, I like for people to give me positive encouragement like that when I've done something good. And, and I just wanted you guys to know that, that I absolutely love the books, regardless of, you know, uh, the, the marketing techniques that you guys are employing. The books are fantastic. So we, first, we appreciate that because yeah, our strategy had been to sleep with every customer. <laughs> and we were, we were doing that because we weren't sure it was very good writing. But then once you told us that, we were able to, we like, were able to stop sleeping with people. <laughs> Yeah, I just book, full so. disclosure. I never actually did that, Nick. <laughs> oh, well, I've got some, sp- <laughs> I've got some splaining to do. You got some life. splaining to do. <laughs> I thought that was the plan, bro. Yeah, well, <laughs> talk about taking one for the team. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. So, okay. So, so yes, where did thank you. where did these books come from? It, it, you know, before there was uh, a marketing plan, before there was uh, all this other stuff, you guys. Uh, I don't know. I'm guessing, but you guys schemed uh, to write some of the best space opera, military sci-fi, and that sort of stuff. Where did the the idea for this, and, and how did you guys decide to implement it? So, I mean, the series as a whole, we started talking about last year, and we really went on. Uh, the books have a different story. We Nick and I started writing what people are reading as book two first, right? Um, and we just wanted to write what we called Star Wars, not Star Wars. Legionnaire initially was going to be a spinoff, and I kind of I, I read a lot of war memoirs and yeah. biographies. Um, we've got just a huge military tradition in my family, so I read a lot of that. And I just thought to myself, wouldn't it be cool to read a memoir like House to House? Only it's a stormtrooper. Only it's like a you know kind of a space marine writing this this war memoir. And so we started. So I started writing Legionnaire. And then we linked up and said, you know, this is all part of one big world and worked on sort of massaging it together. And it just took off like no tomorrow. Yeah. What we wanted to do is we sensed, you know, we were both at a certain place in our other genres. I write post-apocalyptic fiction and, and Jason writes sort of very cool comedy, romantic comedy mysteries. And what we wanted to do was was go into a new market. That's one of the things that is the larger conversation about this whole project is, you know, the writers, I think a lot of the times, and you know, Hank, you want to, sometimes you want to tell a time travel series story. Sometimes you want to tell a werewolf story. You want to do other things. And we we felt that maybe we had maxed our markets 
not that they were we were the most successful people in the world, but we wanted to we wanted to go into a growth market. And I think the three biggest markets that you can approach on Amazon are romance, fantasy, and science fiction, especially sort of space opera, military science fiction. We saw that as a growth market. We talked to a couple of writers that were doing extremely well in there. And we, you know, we were we were casting around, and I think it was more Jason is I like Star Wars, have loved Star Wars since I was a kid. I think Jason reaches the fanatical on it. So I know a lot about Star Wars. There's a lot about Star Wars. Yeah, exactly. If you were broken down by the side of the road, Jason would pull up and you'd say, like, my car's broken down. And he'd say, is knowing a lot of Star Wars, will that help fix this? And then you're like, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's his skill. So, um, so, and I was encouraging him, like, you know, you should write what I try to encourage every writer, write the junk that you would want to read. And then I think what we decided to do with this is take that philosophy to crack level. Because I think there are a lot of people that want to write Star Wars or they want to write a certain type of fiction or whatever. And so they go ahead and try to invent everything out of whole cloth. And what we decided to do was to see how close we could get to Star Wars. We didn't want to do Star Wars characters. We didn't want to do the grand arc. We wanted to avoid all the missteps that Star Wars made. But we definitely wanted to do exactly what you did when you were a kid, Hank. What most of the people listening to this podcast did is when you bought those action figures, when you had a Darth Vader, a Lando Calrissian, a Stormtrooper, maybe you didn't have all the primary characters, but I bet you made a cool story out of Lando, the Stormtrooper, and Darth Vader. You know, like, and that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to take the Star Wars feel, the vehicles, the character types, the blasters, the bounty hunters, light speed, and have fun with it as opposed to what a lot of like you know science fiction purists try to do is you know there's no such thing as light speed and lasers aren't very good weapons and you know all the killjoy stuff we wanted to get rid of that and just really surf hard into that line and then take some of the things that people might recognize for Star Wars and sort of turn them on their head yeah uh you know the thing that really struck me uh, in reading uh, Legionnaire, and then I, I guess I was about halfway through Galactic Outlaws, and, um, and I started kind of just I, I, I paused long enough to think about what it was that I was enjoying uh, because it was just sitting there, just turning pages and just kind of absorbing the story before I really gave it a step back and gave it a critical look as to you know what exactly is going on here. And the thing that I came back with, and, uh, and and you just hit it right, uh, the nail on the head, Nick, is that the, all the killjoy stuff is what I really don't enjoy about science fiction anymore. Uh, yeah. all, all of these science fiction writers uh, are, are just take themselves way too seriously. And yeah. and the science fiction way too seriously, like, like the um, – uh, you know, like the fate of humanity is is weighing in the balance of their make believe story, and and it's just not fun. I just don't enjoy it. I I don't like the the nihilistic attitude um, that I come away with when I read a lot of science fiction. And uh, when I talked to Terry Brooks a couple weeks ago, he talked about writing the uh, the Star Wars uh, the novelization for the uh, the Episode One, and he said that he went and talked to George Lucas, and he told him. Uh, you know, I don't know that I'm the person to write this book because I write adventure fantasy. And George Lucas said, so do I. And uh, and they said, OK, well, I think we're on the same page here. And that, is, you know, and we can you just leave episode one that you know, <laughs> out of the – but what we love about Star Wars <laughs> is that it's – adventure fantasy and yes it's in a it's in a a science fiction setting it's in the you know they say it's way in the past you know whatever um but it's something that it was fun it was it was an adventure story with with all the set pieces and stuff and that's what i got from these books and and you you just said it right there without me bringing that up to you but that's exactly what i loved about it no and it's the truth that you know like you can start out wanting to do things right and noble like i think lucas did but if your philosophy isn't right or you're willing to listen to critics or you're trying to please certain people, you can go horribly wrong, you know. And so, you know, without getting into episodes one, two, and three here, yeah. you know, even what we're seeing, the nihilism of seven, eight, and nine, which I think we're heading towards, 
we've lost those heroes and heroic moments. We wanted, we wanted to go back to that, and we just wanted to play in the feel of that world instead of like what I think so many writers do is they want to do that, but they go ahead and try to invent the same things, rename them, and then somehow they, they expend a lot of brain power trying to invent something out of whole cloth that's already there. You know, or they let the hard sci-fi people bully them about light speed and stuff like that. And it's like, well, you know, you can have both. You can. I think we're getting a lot of people who just want to tune out, turn on, and enjoy. And they don't really, when we say blaster, they don't suddenly need a breakdown of how a blaster works. I think that's where, you know, science fiction sometimes you, they've got to justify to you why the Millennium Falcon can execute a 90-degree turn moving right. you know so fast against an asteroid and just you know what they got anti-gravity plates it's all good you know just have fun kick back <laughs> yeah. right yeah no i think yeah. that is it and Enjoy. i think you see that in fantasy too right Enjoy. i mean yeah no one's sitting there being like well how did the elves become a race they're a race because tolkien and and that's that's it and <laughs> right. star wars right yeah. so star wars 1977 it's pulling from Flash Gordon, and that's like 30 years, you know, that's 1930, so that's about 40 years before. Yep. And it's just taking what exists and saying, we're going to do something else with it, but you know what we're talking about. What Nick and I, I think, hit on to is Star Wars is such a part of our culture, and here we are 40 years later, that we don't have to explain why all this happens, why shields work, why explosions in space can have you know, fireballs. We just say, yeah, this is the way it is. And just allow our readers to have fun. That, that was our whole point. But our story isn't just a Star Wars knockoff because there's a lot of things that have happened in those 40 years that I think reflect in our books. Um, you know, 9-11 happened and Afghanistan happened and all, the, all, all these things happened. And these things show up certainly in Legionnaire and in Galactic Outlaws too. Um, but at its core... It's just taking those elements and saying, look, this is part of our shared cultural cornerstone, and we're going to tell this story, and we're not going to take time explaining what all these things are. You'll catch up. And most people have. And I think where our, our time is spent better in the novel than inventing out of whole cloth or, or you know, justifying everything is that because Star Wars is visual, we really have committed to writing these books so that the reader can see. So that so that you you know like it's weird like when you when you think of the Millennium Falcon weaving through an asteroid field, you have that very specific Empire scene in your head, and then a lot of writers have tried to write science fiction, but they don't know how to convey the visual thrills and you know butt clench moments, and so what we we tried to commit to do is when the reader reads it, read reads these books, we want them to see those moments. So. We spend a little bit more time creating the feel, using the tone, using the right adjectives and, and verbs to describe sort of this urgent action, you know. And so it's visual and fun. And, you know, maybe we don't get bogged down in a lot of the postmodern nihilism or, you know, yeah, we're probably just committing a horrible error by not erroneously providing gender or race to certain characters to please people. We're more interested in them and showing them, in, in showing them the dogfight in the asteroid field. You mentioned uh, a minute ago that uh, that you guys wanted to play in a different genre than you normally publish in. Uh, Jason publishes these fantastic noir mysteries uh, with a with a light touch, uh, and Nick, you uh, you do these post apocalyptic, uh, hopeless with hope, <laughs> um, and uh, you know that that make me. Um, uh, Make make me wander around, you know, like a homeless man for three days when I'm finished reading. Them. Um, but uh, but this is a, a drastic departure for both of you. And and you talked about uh, that as writers, we do want to branch out and do some different things sometimes. Uh, and 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 we're always discouraged, you know. Once you find an audience, how dare you leave that audience? You know, they're they're you'll never you know have success breaking out of your genre and all that. And uh, you know, I came to the realization last year that um, that if I'm not writing what I love, um, I, I don't want to do this. Like I got into this because I, I had stories I wanted to tell, and uh, I, I don't really care uh, about whether this should work or not. You know, I, I'm gonna go do what I want to do. Um, and it, and it sounds like 
you guys are doing that too. Talk about the conventional wisdom that once you have an established audience as a post-apocalyptic author, you should never leave that post-apocalyptic audience. Uh, what What is it about leaving and going to do something else uh, that can actually sometimes jumpstart your career? I think, you know, where I love to write post-apocalyptic fiction and where I was at is that I was beginning to see no growth in my audience. And I was actually beginning to see shrinkage. And because of Amazon, I was beginning to see the incestuous nature of the algorithm. That if you don't approach the, we'll talk about this later, but if you don't approach the algorithm with a certain attitude and the first mindset of that is growth, you're, you're slowly going to sell less and less books if you keep selling to the same people because the algorithm isn't going out to reach other people and introduce you to other readers. So it actually, if you can pull what I call genre jumping, genre, I got off French. Genre <laughs> jumping. Genre jumping. Um, if you can pull genre jumping, it's a great way to find a new audience and to maybe introduce them to your backlist and to to write some 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 junk that you want to get out of your hard drive. Sometimes I want to write Conan the Barbarian stuff, and sometimes I want to write Tolkien. Sometimes I want to write post-apocalyptic, and sometimes I want to write Star Wars. But the conventional wisdom, and if especially at big publishing, is once you lay down that imprint, we're probably net, not letting you out of it. Very few to no measurable people have ever been allowed to jump genre. Effectively, they're indulged. But the publisher would prefer that Stephen King continue to write horror novels. Sure. Yes, the other stuff is excellent. It's good. It's well-received. But it will never make as much money as John Grisham putting out a legal thriller. And John Grisham can write some some interesting sort of little uh, com- comedies and slices of life and even a little bit of romance. But, you know, generally his bread and butter is, is uh, you know, legal Mississippi thrillers. legal thrillers. Yeah. So, you know, at the moment you depart from that, they just, you know, they're frightened – little mice in publishing and and there's good reason to be and what we kind of learned is that if you don't if you don't do it smart and you don't execute the genre jump you actually can hurt yourself um by bringing your old readers to your new concept you can bring them later but you can't bring them initially initially you have to kind of go in and you got to be humble and you got to introduce yourself to a new crowd and you can't rest on your laurels. And there's some pretty big Amazon authors who have tried to, to genre jump, uh, and they've had solid success and then fallen, you know, flat on their face. It's, it's really tough. But I think, you know, we're one of the first people that have successfully pulled. I think Jason and I w- would say we were both successful in our old genres, and we are now successful in this genre. And not a lot of people have been able to do that. And, in fact, a lot of people have actually hurt their careers doing it. So there's a, a very specific protocol to genre jumping. As far as we've, we've pioneered it, yeah. as far as Jason, who is the marketing master who I'll, who I'll ask to speak to this, yeah, there is. <laughs> yeah, no, I, we, we approached it like we were brand new authors. And, and so when we went out with Legionnaire, we acted like we'd never done anything before, just in the way we presented ourselves and how we thought about going it. I think a lot of people think okay, here's the trick. If I just get this many people to get their eyes on my book, either through a book bub or if I just get you know 100,000 uh, newsletter subscribers by selling my soul to get on everybody's email list, I'll be a bestseller. And, you'll ha- and what, what, what will actually happen is you'll have a day of good sales and then it all goes sideways. What we wanted to do was we, we wanted to introduce ourselves as new military science fiction space opera authors from from the ground up and that meant we had to go in alone and approach our launch totally differently than the conventional wisdom of releasing a book and saying hey here's this new book hey everybody give it a shout and i mean within within a week we were just blown away by the results and i think as of today the book's been out for over a month it's still number one in its category um and people had no i mean you think about like you said hank and i appreciate the kind words but think about what i write I write books set in the 1950s about a, about a, a guy and his ghost father who solve crimes. <laughs> it's basically like a, a movie that's written for Gene Kelly to star right. in. Um, <laughs> right? It's like totally out of the blue. And so I'm the guy that shows up and then writes this military science fiction book that has Vietnam veterans talking about what it makes them think of. It's yeah, not what you expect. And it only yeah. happens when we go in from scratch. 
Right. Yeah, I think that was the big thing was, you know, we've all been at this Amazon thing for probably anywhere between four to seven years now. Yeah. And I've been in it. I've been in it since 2011. I've had success and I've had utter failure. And <clears throat> the problem is, is that you begin to pick up a lot of bad habits. Like there are two things that I will say right now that will shock the hell out of people. Getting into the top 100 will not make your career. We just proved that. And getting a book bub will actually hurt your career. And we just proved that too. They're, they are immediate gratification things that book bub provide. Look, I made it into best selling. How many writers do we know immediately run out and say best selling author because they reached the top 100 that they paid for with book bub. And then 24 hours later, they've absolutely fallen off in a crest and they're at like ranking 20,000 and falling fast. The trick is to to get there and stay there, and I think we perfected a method to do that. And it's the opposite of what I would have told you six months ago works. Well, if you just think about the logic of it, uh, if you're if if the the algorithm uh, is watching what books do, and you see a book that has um, fair to moderate sales, and then a book bub happens and sales go through the roof. And then when the book bub is over, sales come back down. You would look at that as an anomaly and, and not something that deserves uh, special treatment from the algorithm. But if you see something that has, uh, you know, uh, great um, a, a surge in sales and maintains that, well, this this obviously is uh, has got some legs to it. So the the book bub model. I, I can see where that that it makes sense that that you would get punished for having those types of spikes. Yeah, it does. When you look at how Amazon actually looks at a book bub or looks at anything, it doesn't. It actually looks at the sales of the people who are buying the book. And that's how it figures out how to distribute your book. So without getting into too fine of points, there are just these all these things that we as writers have been doing, trying to – what we would have told you was manufacture success, but it really was. I mean, let's just – everybody here is a writer. Everybody here has hoped for a Hugh Howey lucky hit. That's true, right? I have. I'm going to mm-hmm. raise my hand in this AA meeting and say, yeah, I have. And, and I, actually, I actually got accidentally, you know, I, I couldn't reproduce the success of The Old Man in the Wasteland, which was my first hit. And, you know, like we all thought like, you know, well, you do your best. You try to write a novel and maybe the algorithm will discover you. Maybe a few people in the right, you know, um, brackets will recommend you and stuff. And, and it'll just begin to happen and everything like that. But that's not actually how it happens. It is there is a science to it. There is an ability to understand it, and it actually requires more restraint than effort. And so that's you know it's it's kind of crazy. But I would say to everybody right now that they've been approaching the algorithm with the wrong attitude from the moment they hit publish. And we we started this this project with Galaxy's Edge. We started it like a year ago, October. We decided we wanted to play with action figures in the dark, dirt. We thought about a concept of, of, of something like Star Wars, Star, Star Wars, not Star Wars. Um, we wanted to write cliche because cliche works. We wanted to have fun. We didn't want to get bogged down. We wanted to, you know, Amazon is not very interested in super literary books, but the people who are on Amazon are binge and series readers like Netflix watchers. They want to have fun. They want to have continuous fun. They're looking to have fun, and they're actually rooting for you to be fun. So you gotta, gotta, you got to come in at their level and have fun. So for six months, we looked at the science of this. We, uh, Jason actually built our own subscription uh, method, which was a way for us to sort of finance the launch, but at the same time recruit a very specific genre base that we would use to launch – who were totally 100% invested in the project to almost religious levels because we kept encouraging intimacy between us, them, and the project. We kept giving them inside peaks. We allowed them to A-B test. We told them which way we wanted to go. We allowed them to create characters. We took six to seven months to get ready for this. We began to stack books. We began to, you know, it's the old, it's the old um, uh, Vince Lombardi quote, you know, it's the will to win is, is good, but the will to, the, the, the will to prepare to win is vital. And so that's, you know, but I still, I, uh, you know, writers still call and try to talk to Jason and I and try to probe us. And we, we did a podcast 
and we broke down the whole method. And we even thought, like, we'll throw in some coachings. We'll do some coachings for people. And we got so many coachings that we actually had to turn that off for a while. <laughs> but what we – yeah, big problem. But what we noticed in the coachings is that even when we told people, listen, these are the steps to reproduce, you're going to have to step back from the edge. And you're going to have to let us help you coach it through it. And you're going to have to take these – these steps to prepare, they didn't want to do that. They want to hit publish and get lucky. Yeah. They want to get their best friend to buy the book. They want to get their mom to buy the book. And I want to say to them, you've just killed the book. Yeah. You've just killed it. Well, and, and what we're dealing with, uh, we, we have an atmosphere now that has been fed, uh, you know, for, for good or for ill, uh, by the, the superstars of the gold rush from a few years ago. And, and back yeah. then, the thing to do was, crank out work, publish it quickly, um, and get, you know, blast it on Facebook, get your, your, uh, your rabid, uh, team of people to go buy it and, and, you know, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat and, uh, and keep feeding the same machine, hoping that the machine grows. Uh, and, you know, people hit, you know, on a, on a, a level of success doing that. Um, but what I saw you guys do is just completely step back. And, and like you said, start preparing these books ahead of time. And, uh, and you were preparing for a launch with, uh, with stuff that wasn't there yet. Uh, so talk about, uh, you just did a, a little bit there, but the, the will to prepare, um, knowing that you're going to launch something a year from now and doing the hard work now, uh, most people will not tough it out be, if, without the, the sense of instant gratification that we're used to. Uh, you know, a, a couple of years ago, the, the thing was, man, just write as many short stories as you can and just put them all up on Amazon so that you have four pages of a back catalog. And uh, whether you actually have a back catalog or not, it looks like you do. <laughs> and, and people are more likely to come buy your one or two novels that you've published. You know, um, you know, it's a, we, we've adopted some weird things that are obviously hurting uh, the publishing industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that that is the case. And I, I think that every writer has to come to grips with – you asked the question actually on your author stories page, and it's a good one. Um, are you writing to put out a piece of art or are you writing for commercial success? And I would say you can do both. Yeah, well, that, that um, was my whole point. I was wanting someone to, to say I don't have to choose both. Why can't – you know? but I, I was – I love seeing mm -hmm. people's reactions. But go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Um, so – Lots of people have said you have to approach publishing as a business because it is a business. And it's just like playing baseball or anything else. You can absolutely love to do it. But if you're going to make a career out of it, you have got to think, okay, what's going to be good for my career? What's going to be bad for my career? What's going to set me up for success and what's going to set me up for a failure? And so you really have to have that in your mind ahead of time. Um, there is absolutely nothing wrong with writing one great book once per year. And releasing it, and the people that find it say, this is an amazing book. I wish more people would read it. That's a good feeling. I mean, that's where I was, right? Um, I was writing one to two books a year, and people loved it, but not that many people bought it. And, and that was above average. I was still selling above average copies, but it, you know, it's not enough to do anything with, except for maybe pay for the next book. Um, so you have to have a game plan in mind and you have to be honest and say, what am I actually trying to do? And if your goal is to make writing your full-time job is to have a comfortable lifestyle because of your writing, you can't just go for instant gratification. You know, you, it's, it's like, like the lab tests, right? You can have the little piece of cheese now, or you can wait and get the big old cheese wheel later. You've got to be willing to do that. Um, most people think they're willing to do it, but they're not deep down. They're not. And it's not what they actually want. Well, and, you know the the other side is uh you know we've all known someone uh you know, I, I went to school with a kid who was like six foot eight or something like that, and everybody wanted him to play basketball so bad, and all he ever wanted to do was be a math teacher and it, you know <laughs> and and you could you could have all of the the business acumen and and believe that that you can uh have all the the business side down and if you don't have a love for it and a passion for it uh it's you know it's going to be hollow and and it's not going to resonate with anyone. So you really need both right. of those, and that's why you know when you read Galaxy's Edge, you know it it hits that that thing in you that you know when I was seven years old and I and I watched Star Wars, I was like, oh god, you know, of course they marketed it well, but it's a good freaking book. 
Yeah, yeah. thank you. I mean, I, go ahead, I Jason. That. Well, I was going to say, I think that, to your point, the point where I realized, oh, you know, thank you, Lord, um, this is something, is when someone pointed out to me that you know, Legionnaire was the most gifted and the most gift-wished yeah. book in its genre. And when I saw that, you know, that tells me so much more than sales because it tells me yeah. that people are reading that book and not just saying, oh, that was a good book. They're saying, my friend Matt needs to read this book and I'm going to give him a copy or I'm going to tell him and he'll add it to his wish list. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. But that came because we were so passionate about what we were writing. Well, that's the, moder- that's the modern equivalent of you passing a book around to all of your friends like a crack dealer. You know, I mean, you've got to read this. You know, this is going to change your life. Uh, I guess the, the gifting it and, 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 you know, wish listing on Amazon is the modern equivalent of that. Amazon makes it so easy for all of us to get excited about a hot book. If we all think back to Andy Weir's The Martian, yeah. it was so mm-hmm. easy to get into the zeitgeist of that book and get excited about it. But it started, you know, he started with a core group of believers who followed him through each chapter and helped him write that book. And they did a lot for him. And then even went, even though they got practically the entire book for free, they went back and bought it. Because they were passionate about it. what I've what I've learned about readers is that when you make the real and the right connection with them and you act like a customer service provider, yeah. that's a big news flash to a lot of writers. This is not your opportunity to um, convince the homecoming queen that she was wrong and you were right, that you really are cool. You know, or I was just talking to a writer who's pretty successful and he was looking at our success and he didn't he doesn't really know that, you know, Jason and I are, 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 are Christians and we have a, a certain moral compass. We love God. We are actually right now very grateful to God for this success. And he was just saying to us, when people get around 10000 a month in sales, they get wacky. Because <laughs> he had seen that re- reproduced so many times where people suddenly think they're Pharaoh, you know, and, and social media allows – you to suddenly think that you have weight and opinion and you can, you can, you know, you can put thumbs up or thumbs down to people's careers. And I, I've heard some pretty horrible stories about big time authors and Hank, you've interviewed a lot of them. You can tell us who's on heroin. No, I'm just joking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you know, you, you know, when people change keep, because of success, I keep that spreadsheet, but, uh, password protected. Keep, yeah. Well, it's your, call it, it's, it's password protected under retirement. <laughs> right. fund. You know? But, 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 you know, I would tell everybody right now, the thing that you have to, when I was at HarperCollins, they would do these seminars for us and teach us, you know, and they said, we went back and we talked to all the old school 70s and 80s authors and we asked them how they built their careers without social media and the internet. And what they said is the nine times out of 10, those writers said, anytime anybody reached out to me with a letter, a fan letter, I wrote them back and made a connection. And that's one way to do it. That's customer service. Another way to do it, if you read an outstanding book that I will recommend to everybody right now that will revolutionize your career, is Chris Fox's Six Figure Author. He gives it a sensationalist title, but it is a scientific, practical, looking at the numbers, how to approach the algorithm. The guy's brilliant. Um, and, it was and the missing link. It was the missing link. And it teaches you how to approach this business as a customer service provider. And he talks about interviewing his readers and, and finding out what they like and then writing to that market. And so every writer that wants success and every writer that even has success, one of the biggest things that I would try to remind every writer, everyone right now is you are nothing but a hooker. You are <laughs> nothing but, you know, you're a service provider and you're there to give people a good time. So do, you know, there's so many tools that Amazon provides to do that. The reviews are a great way to look at and see where you're going right and where you're wrong. I know you have to have your own internal compass. I do. I know where I'm going. But when someone says, like, as we were, see, when we did Legionnaires, the way that we sold that is as stormtroopers in Afghanistan. That was an easy sell. When we went to Galactic Outlaws and, and we were finishing that up the month and Legionnaire was going so off the hook on reviews and it was getting so many sales and literally approaching and breaking 100,000 page reads a day. And we had all these people going, military science fiction is awesome. We love stormtroopers in Afghanistan. This is great. And we're like, uh-oh, but we're going, you know, we're going bounty hunters and smugglers and blasters and a little girl and a giant bot. 
you so go in the Fellowship of the Ring Lisa. in uh, in Star yeah, Wars. Yeah, we went Fellowship of the Ring. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We, I mean, we went the the classic episode. You know, the the the, the seven samurai get together, but it was it was it was different enough that we were concerned. And we had a plan that if, you know, if we went sideways, there was a way to get it back on track. But we were using that customer service to analyze what the market wants and then we want to give it to them. So uh, you were talking about Andy Weir a minute ago and how the, the kind of groundswell uh, happened. Uh, you know, another piece of his phenomenal success was the audiobook. Um, that was just crazy good. And um, when I was reading Legionnaire, I was thinking, man, this is going to make an amazing audiobook. And I know you guys uh, have already been on that. Uh, so what's the plan for audio? And uh, can you imagine uh, the growth that you're going to see when the audio comes out? Yeah, we can imagine. Actually, yeah. We've we, leased we, a BMW we, based on that, <laughs> that growth. You imagine it all the time, actually. Actually, you know, of all the ironies, Jason will tell you right now, I'm going to beat him. Fine, uh, fine. Andy, Andy Weir's people signed us for an audio nice. book, so it's cool. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, so so they signed us um, just based Sorry, on Legionnaire Sorry, alone, Jason. right? No, it's okay. They signed us based on Legionnaire alone for uh, the entire series. They said we want it all, um, and so we were like, "Yeah, that's great." Because we were we were just talking about audio. We were starting to reach out to our own contacts, um, getting to the point where we were ready to start listening to auditions. And then this player comes in and is like, "No, you need to be with us." Um, yeah. They made a very convincing argument. <laughs> Even though I tried to reject it, and um, I don't know, I just I, I have I have I mean honestly I'm not the greatest business person, but Jason's really good. So any business advice is coming out of Jason. I I I just I say a lot of. But we had a good meeting, <laughs> and then the craziest thing of all is that someone announced it, or we announced it, and then someone said, um, "Man, when I read this book, I heard Ray Porter reading it, and they tagged him." And then he jumped on and said, I'd love to read this book. Oh, so we were like, yeah. Yeehaw. <laughs> oh, that's, uh, that's awesome. Um, how many books did they, uh, did they sign uh, for the audio? Uh, nine. Yeah, that's what I thought you said. Um, yeah, yeah, Galaxy's yeah. Edge is a trilogy. How's that going to work? No, no, well, no, it looks like books. a trilogy. So what Amazon <laughs> does, what Amazon does, is it just however many books you have on your series page, it says of three. Yeah. So when we add the next book, it'll say X of four, X yeah. of five, X of nine. Um, but our plan is to to release a new one every month. Um, that's what we're working towards, which is why both of us are writing it together because we would probably yeah, die yeah. by the end of book nine. It would be like you know, like that that f- that furious writing session, and we write the end and then just die at the right. keyboard. <laughs> Which I yeah. think is what George R. R. Martin has planned, right. and, um, and you leave the uh, all of the proceeds of the book to your children, because, because right now, <laughs> well, my half, my yeah. half goes to my kids. I, as a pharaoh. It will all be buried with me, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, including including a living wife. Nicole. Yeah, I was about to say yeah. Nicole was like, "No, I'm going to the donut shop." Yeah. <laughs> no, she's being buried alive. Right. Um, run, Nicole, we'll run. We just tell Nick, yes, we'll honor your wishes. Like everyone just humors right. Nick about these things. We will give you an author stories podcast. The next book after uh, Galactic Outlaws is called Tilting, and that returns to the Legionnaires. And then the book after that is called Attack of the Shadow. Ooh. That's that's very mm-hmm. uh, uh, very Lucas ish in the title there. Yeah, that was just super look at, like, <laughs> he was like, like, this sounds like the movie that George wanted to make but didn't. Uh, so I like, yeah. yeah, it sure does. I mean, it's ridiculous. Attack of the Clones. Yeah. Come on. You know, like, that is like, I get that it's the Clone War and Clones, but like, it, it could have, it's just so weird. But Attack of the Shadows was, uh, Attack of the Shadow was so much better. And I think it, when I said it first to Jason, to there was like, yeah, there was like a whole like minute long pause, and I'm like, it sounds like a movie, doesn't it? He goes, yeah, it sounds like Attack of the Clones. <laughs> you know, I think George Lucas, in his defense, and and I have no right to defend yeah. him because I don't I don't know him, but um, in his defense, I get the idea that he's making up titles that are like throwbacks to Saturday afternoon serials. You know, at the movie theater, I'm sure that's what and it he's is. doing it with a wink, and everybody's like, "Who is this pretentious jerk?" You know, and he's like, "No, no, no, no! You, you're you don't understand. It's supposed to be fun, and you're taking my thing, right. and you're making it not fun anymore." Yeah, 
I think, I think that's right. you've you've hit the nail on the head, and this is where we should we should. Wha- I mean, every time Star Wars is mentioned among nerd culture, which is what we are, it should be tried and found guilty. <laughs> and you know, like it was all that fun, and then you know, and then Phantom Menace came along, and we were all kind of adults, and it, it, that was pretty bad, you know. And but we got through. But it was still good, you know. Like it was still like yay, you know. It was it was good enough. But there are crazy moments that are so bad. But now we're heading into this thing where it's just, in our opinion, it's just going so sideways with this great Jedi storyline. It's very nihilistic. There's nothing to root for. It's super downbeat. They killed Han Solo, which they might have well just taken 12-year-old me and raped me in the parking lot. <laughs> you know, can you, can you be more descriptive or graphic, Nick? Is that possible? <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> Han Solo gets stabbed by his kid. By his kid. You know, it's like, could you, I mean, I know... Harrison Ford wanted to die in Empire. I get that. Return of the Jedi, right? But like, is that lost on anybody that we've gone from Saturday afternoon matinee, Return of the Jedi, The Empire Strikes Back, bold heroes, Luke Skywalker swinging across a chasm with the princess to our favorite character getting stabbed by his kid. Does, Does anybody not see the massive disconnect with the audience? And I live out in crazy land where they make that stuff and they, they will look you in the face and go, I think that's a really emotionally resonant storyline. It's like, no one likes it. It's horrible. I walked out of that theater so freaking pissed that I had to force myself to finish my bucket of popcorn, <laughs> but, I fi- but I finished it, but it was rage. I was rage eating by the last of that. Yeah, I, I get it. So. I get it. Um, <laughs> so what we wanted to do is we wanted to go back and correct it. And, and I'm not saying like, we're not writing Star Wars and showing you like, and this is where it should have gone. <laughs> this is where Luke and Leah should have kissed and had a kid. We're not doing Footnote. that. What we wanted to do, yeah, <laughs> what we wanted to do is we wanted to take an archetype character like Obi Wan Kenobi and instead make him a bounty hunter with Alzheimer's. And we wanted to we wanted to examine the Han Solo archetype and really play him as Han Solo instead of like, ah, shucks, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And we just wanted to examine some of those things, but really we just wanted to play with action figures in the dirt. And I think that's what people are digging. Do you have Jedi uh, in in your series or an equivalent? I think that we introduced the Force in a very super bare term in the last, the last what was it, like paragraph of Galactic Outlaws. Right. I would say we have Sith. Mm-hmm. But the argument can be made there's no Jedi. There's the Force, and it's really only used by this one guy who went out and found it. There's no midichlorians. You're not born with it. You have to go find it. And he found it, and now he's going he's gonna to make the universe right. Right, yeah, according to his will. Yeah, we, we definitely buy into the whole idea of Frodo Baggins is a once- in a universe type individual that can take that ring and throw it into mountain, right? That can take that, right. undertake yeah. that quest. Most people, when they put the ring on, become Gollum. Right. And, yeah. and, that, and so we kind of felt like that was the case with any kind of force that we bring up. And so um, good people can resist it, but what happens to good people if they acquire it? We're, yeah, we're like, and what we wanted to do more about the galaxy is we really wanted to do more about the regular people of the yeah. galaxy. We wanted to do here's an old action. Remember Lotar? Remember that guy? Yeah. He was no. he was Lando Calrissian's assistant. Oh, Lobot. Wore, Lobot. That's yeah. right. The guy with the we headphones. Wanted, and I, yeah, yeah, and IG88 yeah. and Bosk. Was it Bosk? Bosk. 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 Yeah, Bosk. We wanted to do their stories. We wanted to have fun with those people. The Force. Really, it's fun and all that kind of stuff, um, but obviously it has absolutely taken over Star Wars. And if you really, I think if you look at it, it should not have, from its initial inklings, it shouldn't have. So we wanted to specifically stay away. And when we were initially developing that, like, like we were saying, let's not have any force. Let's just tell the stories in this galactic empire. But as we began to introduce this, this guy called Goth Sullis, we began to realize that he was a force user. So we had to approach that in a different way. And we wanted to show exactly what Jason says is that, you know, one person in in a galaxy is Frodo Baggins and everybody else is Gollum. How are you guys handling uh, a 
a nine book arc. Uh, this is uh, this is intense. These are not small books. These are you know you think uh, you know uh, ebooks releasing once a month. Okay, maybe these are forty fifty thousand word. No, these these are these are actual novels. Um, and uh, that's a lot of work you guys uh, have turned out already and are planning to turn out once a month. Uh, how did you guys handle the planning of it? Uh, just the, the logistics of that, and how are you guys working together uh, to to get this done? So we have a rule, and that is not to take our t- ourselves seriously. Good and by that, I mean we can't bog <laughs> ourselves down with saying we're creating important art and – Will this part be art or will this not? Our whole goal is to write a very entertaining story. And I think because we're both good writers, uh, I mean, at least Nick is, um, we're able to... You're better than me. Oh, well, thank you. You know, people said that. I didn't want to say it out loud, but since you're saying it... (laughs) I said it through tears and I'm rage eating. (laughs) I know. (laughs) But I mute as I shove the popcorn into my mouth. (laughs) Um... We want to we want to write a story that will captivate from the start to the finish, and I think it gets a lot easier when that's your goal. Yeah. When you decide I'm going to write a story that when people are done they're going to say I'm glad I read that, as opposed to saying I want to write a story that okay maybe it's not a great story per se, but what I'm saying is so important that everyone will have to respect me. We don't care yeah. if you don't respect us. We just want you to have fun. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and, we, and again, the, the, I think the other guiding philosophies are we use cliche because cliche works. It's cliche because cliche works. Um, we we don't apologize for good guys. Yeah, we don't apologize for good guys. We definitely just wanted to use action figures. And, and so, you know, it's, it, we wanted to use like those action figures that we used to get from, you know, the, the toy store. We, we literally wanted to use them so we know – kind of how we want a character build and we know that they not every story has to involve luke and leia it can be bosk and ig88 so we want to play with those things yeah who was he he was he was uh he was zuckus's companion oh the protocol droid that had the kind of insectoid head yes and then zuckus was the shorter guy with the the bug eyes and and the Uh, anyway i'm sorry (laughs) and so remember walrus man who was he Ponda Baba. Oh, man. See, his lure is deep. Do we have a size so, Noodles uh, analog? <laughs> we should. Oh, yeah. We should totally just start having a musical. Yeah. yeah. Music number breakout. <laughs> Max Rebo shows up That's for right. a cameo. What are they right. going to do? What's Disney going to do? They already stole the um, money. <laughs> but we'll, like, we just, the important thing is we're on the back of the tiger now, and we have to stay, to stay on the back of the tiger we have to produce content. So the, the big thing was to know where it ends. We know where book nine ends, but even when we were in negotiations with Podium, believe it or not, they were already mentioning second and third series. So wow. people have already, like, who've read it, they've already said, you are going to do a series based on the Savage Wars. And we're like, which is our version of the Clone Wars. We call it the Savage Wars. And there's a reason that there are savages and blah, blah, blah. And Jason actually came up with that whole work. It's brilliant. So after the nine books, we're going to jump into that and get into that. So we know where this ends, and then we know where we want to go, and then we know where this picks up again. If if everybody keeps liking it and the sales are there, we'll keep doing it. And it seems to get more effortless the more we do it and the less we take ourselves serious. And, you know, I think that maybe that is the problem with Star Wars is that when we were sitting there watching The Force Awakens, everything had to seem so important. But my favorite part in that movie is when they're running from the TIE fighter assault and and the kid is saying, let's take that ship over there. And the girl says, nah, it's nothing but a piece of junk. And it pans it on the Millennium Falcon. Exactly. That was like, that was the best moment. And if you made a whole... Yeah, the entire theater laughed. You know, and when I saw yeah. it, yeah, they were like, "Oh yeah!" yeah and laughing and cheering. You know, yeah. I know that that the, and the thumbs you know, up if from you, BB-8. Yeah, if you take that as opposed to Episode Four, when we were all first, you know, if they would have for every, for everybody saying there's so many parallels between Four and Seven, when we walked out of Four as kids and the Death Star had just blown up and Luke Skywalker and Han got a medal, not Chewbacca. You felt like a mil- You felt like when you first saw Rocky, you wanted to go out and get in a fight just to beat people up, you know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, 
And when you walk out of The Force Awakens, you want to slash your wrists because Luke Skywalker is a train wreck living on an island. <laughs> it's emo Luke. When the galaxy needs him most, he just leaves. Yeah, yeah he just leaves. Yeah, it's just so... And Han Solo just got stabbed by his kid. And that's... You know, I was like, what? While his best friend watched. <laughs> While his, best, mm. his dog, well, his dog right. basically yep. watched. The life that just goes down the drain. <laughs> Tell you what, my cocker spaniel would have ripped his throat out. But oh yeah, that's yeah. another. Always yeah. let the cocker spaniel win. You guys have put together some of your thoughts about why uh, your book launch for Legionnaire was a success, and and you have since followed that up. Uh, and, 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 and pretty much done the same thing with Galactic Outlaws book two. And, uh, you already have book three staged and it looks like it's going to meet the same success. Um, and, and you guys are offering this, uh, to other authors to help them to, uh, to hopefully have the same sort of success. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about what you're doing. What is your, uh, what were your thoughts, uh, about putting this, thing together this package that you're offering to people and what do you hope to accomplish with it right well part of it is just for practical purposes and we should add actually there's a publisher that asked if they could take the course and we said yeah totally um and you know just for uh confidentiality we have to keep it quiet but they just launched to number one in their category using the same principles so we're fairly confident that we've got it figured out but it was it was a practical thing most of our friends most of the people that know us you know we'll just tell them you know we're not trying to get rich off of them but the reality is when you see huge success it comes with uh, a huge demand for access yeah and we've told you our schedule and it got to a point where we said, people want this. And when we're like, I don't really have time to get into this, I've got to hit my word count today or it all falls apart. Right. The answer kept being like, well, can't you just record it? I'll pay for it over and over again. And you see that enough times and you say, okay, fine. Let's, let's, take, let's clear Saturday. Let's record it and let's do that. Um, so our hope is that we can just share. It's, it's all raw data. Like we're telling you exactly what we did. We tell you our exact numbers day by day by day, how it ranked, uh, how the page reads kind of revealed what the algorithm was doing. The mistakes we made in our previous genres, you know, the mistakes I made with, with Till Death. I launched the second book of Till Death with a book bub, and it did great for two days. And then it died a terrible death. Um, and I know why now. But it's just you don't know what you don't know. And we thought this is a good way that we can give information that will help people, um, but also still be protective of our time. Um, because, like, seriously, I've, I got people being fairly rude when I'm like, I don't have time. You know, I've got a full time job and a family, and I'm writing, and I just don't have time to answer all your questions, perfect stranger. <laughs> and that's where the profanities begin. <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I think what. Uh, what I wanted to do is, is you've known me for years, Hank. You know, I, I think you know, hopefully. I like to help everybody. I really do. And what we were getting is, is tons of direct messages. Tell me what you did. Tell me what you did. And what we didn't want to do is do, this is the Nick and Jason's launch method. You know, and this is how you're going to reproduce our success. I don't know that that's going to happen. But I was in the military, and so what you do in the military after any operation is you do what's called an after-action report. You say, this is what we did right, this is what we did wrong, we went out and we met the enemy here, this is what happened when we engaged them, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. You basically break down what happened. You don't give any of your philosophy or, you know, there's no methods, we're not trying to sell you a course, we just really just dumped the raw intelligence onto people. What we found out is that I think the two most stunning things is that it is the attitude with which people approach the algorithm that's killing them. And even and I was making this mistake, too. There is a certain <laughs> it's really weird, but believe it or not, Amazon is an AI. That's yeah. the most stunning thing you need to know. And if you don't approach it with that mindset and how it perceives you, which it doesn't it actually thinks about something completely different. And that's how it, it, it chooses to sell your book. And it's very easy if you just approach it with that attitude and then you coax it to sell the book. The method, like if we were to have a method, I think Chris Porto, he called it, it was something like the dumb launch. Right. Because it's, it's so stupid what you do and it actually works. 
But what we've all been doing is the book bug and get everybody to buy it and blah, blah, blah. And the what you find when you look at all the data and you break down all the metrics and you talk to people who have reproduced the success, what you actually find is that everything you're doing is actually killing your book. Yes, for a moment, you might feel like, oh, my gosh, I got to 4,000. I got to 200. You might feel good, but you've actually critically wounded your book because it has nowhere to go. And it, it's just weird. But, like, getting in the top 100 can actually – this is the craziest thing – can actually be one of the worst things you can do if you get there on too broad a base. Uh, speaking of your base, uh, what does this mean for uh, for your post-apocalyptic career and, Jason, for your uh, noir ghost mystery? Uh, it, you guys have, have uh, locked into this nine-book arc uh, and people want spinoffs of it already. Um, and when you jump genre, are you able to jump back to your old genre and continue to write those other things? Or are you now uh, military sci-fi guys? How does that work? So, I mean, Nick, you could probably you could probably answer closer than I have. I think there's more of a demand for Nick. Um I had one book left for, for Till Death to kind of round out that series anyway. And, and my plan was to release it this year. Um, there's a verse in the Bible where everyone's singing about how, you know, Saul slain his thousands, but David slain his, his ten thousands, thousands. Yeah. right? Yeah. So, so till death sold its thousands, um, Legionnaire is in a whole different category. And so like, I haven't received a single email from someone being like, Hey, this is great, but make sure the next till death comes. Um, <laughs> But I receive <laughs> daily messages from people being like, uh, yeah, I need, I need Kill Team now. And we're like, we're releasing them every 30 days. Like, but they're serious. Like, I don't care. I'm done now. <laughs> Give it to it's me, like now. You're Give a, me now. It's like you're a major league baseball player, but someone from the 7-Eleven you used to work at says, hey, can you come back? You used to really put those hot dogs on the roller. Great. Right. <laughs> you're like, yeah. nah, I'm good. Like, right. Put the free Here's base pipe down. I'll get it yeah. to you in 30 days. It's, right. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I'm in the middle of the weird series, so I do get people that are worried that I'm not going to get back to that, and I am going to get back to that, and I have a plan for it. But this is we are on the back of the tiger now, so this has to take so you've got to um, ride the tiger priority. Yeah, I think I, what I think is when you do these sort of team ups, it's sort of like musical theater. You suddenly become Rogers and Hart, and so. Probably Ann Spock and Cole right now are a brand unto themselves because I would say there's been a slight uptick in our bat, bat catalog, mm -hmm. but because we went so hardcore into such a specific genre, they are not interested in my crazy little make them up zombie books. Right. They they will just put down this science fiction book and pick, pick up uh, B.V. Larson or um, Jasper T. Scott you know, or any of those um, – Chris Fox, Richard Fox, mm -hmm. Daniel Aronson, Nick Webb, they'll just go right to that because those guys all, in fact, that was part of the plan is that we actually had to get together with those guys and sort of, I mean, believe it or not, get their okay to play. Um, they had to kind of green light us to play in their world, uh, which is space opera and military science fiction. It was respectful. It was a nice thing to do. Um, they actually helped us. They wanted us to succeed because they know that in military science fiction, the demand is so voracious that there's enough for everybody to play. And so what they want to do is see you succeed so you can help them succeed. So that was, that was kind of a really stunning thing because I think in a lot of other genres, it's super competitive. And there are even people, you know, writers that try to start little rap wars with other writers to, to like convince, you know, that's just lame. And what I found in the science fiction community of the people that helped us and advised us and were kind to us, everybody that I've just mentioned, is that they were the nicest, most welcoming, honestly interested in our success people. And they were the first ones to come to us and say, um, you knocked it out of the park beyond our expectations. And when we asked them for like, well, where are we at? Where are we at? What happens next? They're all, uh, you're unchartable. You're way down the road. So they were just, they, and it was genuine. It was super cool. And we are now in turn in our own, way we're just happy to help them you know beat us and knock us down and not knock us down but you know like for them to go up because that's going to happen and we want to we want them to be successful because they're going to help us be successful well the interesting thing is when you when you have a genre that's hot 
and uh, that is uh, uh, attracting a lot of attention. Uh, good quality players uh, don't do anything but uh, but make the genre hotter. It would seem like because, like you said, when they finish your book. Uh, it, when they're waiting for the next one, they're, they're going to go grab, uh, you know, Jasper's uh, book or, uh, yeah. you know, Chris's book. And, and then they're, they're staying, uh, you know, honed in on that genre. And then when the next, uh, Galaxy's Edge book comes out, they're, they're still there and they're, they're still primed for it. So it, yeah. it seems like keeping it healthy is a good thing. Yeah. Crappy books really hurt everybody. That is, and that's, that's something that we as all as authors should really police each other about. And there are people, you know, we can't, you know, we can't get together in the middle of the night and beat someone down in a parking lot because they made their own cover, but maybe we should. No. Um, you watch but, Rocky again. Didn't no, you? but like, you know, you'll see these, <laughs> you'll see, uh, I watch at least, I watch Rocky at least once a day. Um, and then Rocky three, but the thing, uh, <laughs> The thing that is crazy is that you will see in the reviews, you will see people say they'll talk about other bad fiction and they'll be surprised they read yours. And the weird thing is you're seeing a lot of people that read one too many crappy 99 cent novels. It doesn't have to be 99 cent. There are people that write bad other, but we, we know the crappy novelists who like, and this is something we should talk about right now. You can have all the method that you want. You can, you, I'm telling you right now, if you go to this podcast and you listen to it, we will revolutionize your game in what we tell you. If you apply these steps, you will sell more books. I can guarantee you that. If you read Chris Fox's book, Six Figure uh, Author, you will sell more books if you apply those steps. The problem is that you can only sell once. Like the beginning of a series, you can only sell that series once. You can lure in everybody on Amazon to buy one book. That's all you can do. But it's the quality of your writing and your approach to craft that will make them buy book two. And there are a lot of authors who've had one big book sale and they went on to write nine books and no one bought them. And they lost all their money and it was a big old waste of time. So what do I mean by quality? We paid um, $1,200 for the, the, the cover of, of Galactic Outlaws. It's very expensive. I hired a a video game artist from the company that I work with and do world building for in Irvine who works with Riot Games and Blizzard and some really big titles. And that guy gave us a pro level cover. Uh, Jason's guy is just as good. That guy's a painter and an artist. His price was a little better, but, but well, still and, and it's fair, expensive. He, he did basically three covers right. in his time and then, and then said, so here, here are three covers I've done so far, which were all right. amazing. And, like, yeah. and here's the bill for that. Which one should I finish? And we're like, okay. Yeah. yeah, we didn't know how to rope him in, and it would have probably been closer to the other guy. But both guys are pro-level artists, and you see people that are literally making their own covers. that are going to cover mills or you know whatever. So that's step one. Our editor, David Gatewood, who is the best, I think, um, he – he pretty much like turns us up di- upside down and fleeces us of all our money because he's so expensive, but he's worth it. He makes the book better. We highly recommend him, but we pay a good two to three thousand dollars for his editing. So you can't, you know, the myth of Hugh Howey that Amazon and other people tried to create is that you can come in and you can get accidentally lucky, and that allowed Amazon to get a lot of free content from a lot of writers, but. It is a business. You do have to invest in the tools. You have to invest in cover. You have to invest in marketing. You have to invest in editing. You have to master all of these things. And that will help you to, I would say to most people, that if you, if you followed all these steps, you could most likely be earning a living as an author within three years. But it actually requires hard work. And if you're working another job like Jason, you know, You've literally got to go to your family and say, you guys are going to need to, you know, help me by sacrificing so that I can get more word count done. And then Jason does all the marketing and he does all the administration and all this other stuff. So it's a business and an effort and you have to master it if you're going to go in there. Don't try to get accidentally lucky because that's not real money. That's just, you know, a fluke money. So I've said a lot of things to say you got to come with your A game. Right. Well, and the adage is uh, that the harder you work and the more you prepare, the luckier you are. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, and and that's that's one of those cliches. That's a cliche yeah. for a reason. You know. Yeah. Um, what I would tell so, everybody right now is I would say back off and stop publishing, 
and take take a good nine months off and stack three or four books. Because what if you did get lucky and you knocked it out of the park on your next book? Are you ready to release another book in 30 days? Because that's what the a- algorithm absolutely demands. Yeah. And if you go to 60 days, the algorithm is literally starving for you. It's starving for more sales. But on day 61, it just writes you off. And now all that work that you did, it's gone forever. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. I, I think that if your goal is to make a living off of writing, you've got to approach it like you would any other business, right? So if you're passionate about coffee and you want to start a coffee shop, yeah, you can get by. Yeah, you can, you can get by by having really good coffee in just a dingy, terrible shop that, that doesn't cost much money and is in the wrong part of town. And if someone comes in and finds your coffee and says, Oh, this is actually really good coffee. Great. But realistically, are you going to get hundreds of customers a day? Probably not. And then you're going to get disillusioned and say, well, this just isn't working. I wasn't lucky. You've got to put the work in to be successful before you start. Um, because I think you're right. I, I think Nick's absolutely right. The years of writing a novel and it just taking off and celebrities are tweeting about it and everything else, it, it's gone. Yeah. I think that uh, that really sums it up. Uh, guys, gone, where... That was happening compared to when Nick was first really. <laughs> Uh, we're going <laughs> to, I'm going to link up the books in the show notes, but where can people, if they're interested in this after action report and, uh, and kind of get down in the weeds with you about what it is exactly that you did. And uh, I was amazed, uh, Jason, when, uh, I, I, well, one, I could tell that you were a fan of military, uh, memoirs because you read, uh, those numbers and, uh, and the, the day by day debriefing, uh, as if you were, you know, coming out of a foxhole, and uh, it was it, it was you know a riveting narrative uh, the way you put it together. Uh, but you know, if people want to get into that, where uh, where are you guys hosting that, and where can they find it? So if you go to galacticoutlaws.com, that's our website. Um, we have it available there. So go to galacticoutlaws.com, go to the shop, you'll see the Legionnaire After Action Report, and that's where you can sign up for it if you want to hear it. Um, you know, if we're already friends, just talk to us. But, uh, <laughs> but if you don't know us well, um, you know, it's nothing personal. But we've we've got to keep writing. Yeah. Well, and uh, you know, I, I did not come to you guys and ask uh, for you to download on me your secrets. Uh, I think I came to you, Jason, and said, "Hey, um, uh, you know, tell me about this package that you put together." Because uh, you know, what, if we're gonna support each other, let's really support each other. And uh, mm-hmm. you know, that's. Uh, well, it was vital. It's got a little. It was vital. The, to, it was vital I'm to sorry. tell. I'm sorry. I was vital to tell you because I think you are the high priest of writing. You know, and that you're you're passionate about it, and you have a sweet spirit about it, and you're genuinely interested in in helping people communicate with writers and writers communicating with people. And as you well know, as an interviewer, not all writers are great communicators. And I think I think you make it really accessible and easy for people to sort of suck that marrow and that wisdom because you're passionate about it. So we had to share it with you because that's really like we're not looking to get rich off of this. We did monetize it, but we we really do. I think this will actually strengthen everybody's game. It'll help them and it'll probably strengthen all of us because one of the problems with the algorithm is that it is cluttered by a lot of junk most specifically sort of the shirtless, you know, space marine porn or shifter porn or whatever <laughs> that Amazon's got to get rid of. But like if people would approach the algorithm with a, with a more pure attitude, um, it would actually allow for all of us, I think, to sell a lot more books. So that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Well, um, and, and like I told both of you before, um, all the business stuff aside, all the marketing and all, all that stuff aside, um, I love these books. And uh, thank you guys for, for doing that because it, uh, it really, uh, honestly, um, kind of revived my faith uh, in the genre. And because I, I just completely sworn off of, of those types of books. And, uh, and you gave me something to love again. So thank you for that. Yay. Yeah. Thank you, Hank. So, all right, guys. Well, uh, thanks for taking time to come on the show. We're going to send everybody to go pick up uh, the two books that are out now. And uh, and you heard it here, folks. are coming out once every 30 days. We're going to hold them to it. Uh, thanks for coming on, guys. KTF. Ooh, uh... 
Stay tuned now for a clip from the Jason Crane series by Richard Glebes. There's a link to the entire series in the show notes. As always, tune in every Tuesday and Friday for new episodes of the Author Stories Podcast. Find all of the archives at hankgarner.com. Now on to our clip from the Jason Crane series by Richard Glebes. I was ten years old when I saw my first ghost. The year was 1770. My father was a barber. He kept a small shop at the Kuenhoven Inn, where the King's Road met the Old Loop. Our modest home lay to the north, between the inn and the hanging tree. A simple box of pine boards, whitewashed with crushed oyster shell, one room with a spinning wheel for mother, a chair for father, and up a ladder of branches, a garret where my parents slept. I slept on the floor below, alongside my little brother, Hans, five years younger than I. Our floor sloped toward the Hudson, so that when Hans rolled over in his sleep, he often went on rolling and couldn't stop, collecting splinters and grievances. Yet on this particular night, he slept peacefully, and I was the fitful one. A mouse had taken shelter in our wall, fleeing the October chill. It scritched and scratched, nibbling a nest for itself. The sound thrilled me. I possessed a vivid mind, full of toadstools and bullfrogs and lightning storms, and so imagined a skeleton writhed in the wood, the bones of Anne Underhill, perhaps, murdered by Indians at Spook Rock. I'd heard that tale from my father, who reveled in the Dutch superstitions. He would gather us to fireside on winter nights and spin tales of the Heer of Dunderberg, that storm king who rattled our white windows, of the Lady of Raven Rock, who died in snowfall, pining for her lover, of trolls beneath the penny bridge and hobgoblins in the hanging tree. He'd filled my head with such dark romance that I lay waiting for Anne's little finger bones to drag me off to some bloody fate. I rather hoped she would. A cloud cleared the moon, and a square of light fell on my mother's spinning wheel. The sharp spindle glinted, and the wheel began to turn, without touch. A figure appeared before me, as through a mist, a gray head bent to the work. She fixed me with eyes black as open graves and whispered in a low, guttural hiss, Spin, or you shall not eat. I cried out and fell to my pallet, arms over my head. Hans awoke, lost his balance, and rolled away, bleeding with pain as he struck the riverside wall. Father emerged above. Agatha, what is wrong? There's a ghost, Papa. A ghost, help me. Hans laughed despite his bruises, and Mother moaned and ordered us to sleep. But Papa descended and took my hands, his blue eyes twinkling. What did you see? An old woman, she said. Spin or you shall not eat. Oh, he raised a candle beneath his chin. You saw old Willow. She lived here long ago, when this was the home of Isaac Hart, our candle maker. Her husband was killed by savages. Hart took her in at the request of Lord Phillips, who paid a token sum for her upkeep. But Hart was greedy and kept the money for himself. He never fed her unless she spun. So Willow spun and spun and spun like a spider, year by year, growing old and blind and falling to waste. She died at that spinning wheel, fell over one day, and the spindle pierced her heart. Hans screamed and hid beneath the table. Mother appeared above. Daniel Van Ripper, you are a fool. I kissed Papa's fingers, for I loathed that spinning wheel. I'd be no toothless ghost, spinning and haunting little girls. I felt pity for such a spirit, and gratitude to have her example before me, stealing my resolve. Every night thereafter, 